Morning, everyone. Morning. Welcome to the May 28th session of the Prescott Planning and Zoning Commission. The commissioners here today, Mr. David Stringer, George Sheets, uh, Lenz Camardo, uh, and uh, Ken Maverick, Mr. Terry Marshall, and my name is Tom Metzger. I'm the chairman. And we will start out with the, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the uh, last meeting, May 14th meeting. Motion to approve. Second. Okay. Any discussion on it? Everybody read it. Okay, I have a motion and second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Approved. All right, public hearing items. This is for an SUP 14005. Uh, 930 Ruth Avenue request to replace an existing pole with a new 60 foot pole. George, you're going to handle that? Yes, sir. Okay. So, this is a request for a cell site installation. Um, the intent is to place it at an existing location adjacent to a ball field, and I'll show you a aerial photo in just a moment that indicates the location. Um, I just want to point out that the neighborhood is primarily commercial zoning at the site and west of the site. Um, east of the site, a mix of commercial, multifamily, and single-family zoning. The location itself is actually a replacement of an existing pole that holds up a net behind the backstop of the ball field. So in this photo, you can see um, what's effectively the dugout for um, the ball field, and they will be actually constructing this just behind it, about where the shadow is there. Um, the intent is to take the existing pole that holds the netting down, replace it with a slightly larger pole, diameter-wise, same height, and attach the antenna array at the top of that, reattach the netting to that same pole. So it'll still serve the function that the pole serves today, plus it'll have the cell site attached to the top of that pole. The overall height will stay the same. It's 60 feet now, it'll be 60 feet when they're done. It'll just have an antenna array attached to it. Just a little bit more information. You can see there are tennis courts um, located immediately to the north. Uh, the ball field itself is down here. Um, the actual compound will look somewhat like this. So you have the dugout. You have the new equipment building that we uh, described in the staff report to you. Then you have a fence compound with the actual antenna array attached to the existing pole. So they're going to fence around the existing pole. Well, they'll fence around the replacement pole, which will go in the same location. And then the antenna array will be attached to the top of that. And the antenna array is pretty much a standard um, cell tower type of an array. You can see um, it has three arms on it. Each of the arms has antennas facing um, particular directions to provide 360 degree coverage. Um, the equipment is is actually going to be located, including a backup diesel generator, will be located in a um, equipment cabinet that's going to be built into and attached to the backside of that dugout. So it'll have a, a building surrounding it. Uh, noise mitigation will be part of that construction. Um, it is in fairly close proximity to residential property across Ruth Street to the east. So we will want to make sure that that um, sound attenuation requirement is uh, complied with as part of the building permitting. We do have one letter of opposition that was included in the packet uh, for you. Uh, the opposition was specifically to pole heights in the vicinity of the, air, or the uh, hospital and the helipad at the hospital that um, that any type of extended pole heights like these are potentially uh, a hazard to navigation for helicopter pilots flying the emergency uh, helicopters in and out. Um, I will point out that this would be one of many poles of this height or slightly higher that exist between Roost Street and the hospital. Um, staff did not find anything in particular that would make this situation uh, worse or worsen the situation for helicopter pilots flying in and out. Um, we did not get any opposition or comment at all from the hospital. They were included in our noticing, so we would anticipate that this is probably going to have a um, neutral, if, if any, effect at all uh, on that. 
We do have a representative from Verizon here who could speak to any questions you may have, and I'm not sure if he wants to make any presentations about that. And then uh, staff will conclude its report and is open to questions. Uh, first question is the, uh, the letter you received from Ms. Rusing. I assume she was an administrator at YRMC, is she? I don't believe so. I believe she's an employee there. So she's writing this letter on her own, not yes. as a representative? That's correct. It's not on letterhead. It you was talk sent to, to us directly. Have you talked to her? I did not. I mean, I wonder if she understands this is a replacement of an existing pole. It's not like we're putting up a brand new hazard. But she also has recommended that we contact uh, F FAA and... Uh, Get approval. Yeah, I mean, is that... In, in doing our due diligence is that she, she recommended uh, we talk to the medevac pilots and FAA uh, just doing due diligence do you think that's something we should be doing? Uh, if, if something is in close proximity to flight paths or near for instance in this case the helipad at the hospital or near the airport we do involve our airport folks and it is um, required on the um, the the, the applicant, in this case Verizon, to make sure that they've met all of the FAA requirements as part of their submittal for building permitting to us. So a lot of that happens after uh, this initial approval and prior to actual building permits being issued. I, uh, yes, sir. A, thank you. Uh, George, there's a line here in Ms. Uh, Rushing's letter. Uh, it would be a severe blow to our community if we lost our medevac services due to these cell towers. Is there, is there any concern on the part of the city or the administration of the uh, facility, the Yellow uh, uh, Regional Medical Center, is there any concern on their part that these, this tower would compromise that service? None that I'm aware of. We haven't received any comments from anyone uh, officially, either from um, Yavapai Regional Medical. And they were given adequate notice? <coughs> yes, they were part of the notice. Thanks. Well, I mean, the, the YRMC, is, is, isn't that a 50-foot building by itself? You know, we're talking about about the same height as they're building it's out there. Actually, <coughs> taller than that. Yes, mm -hmm. it, it's closer to 70 feet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, could the uh, could uh, the Verizon rep kind of explain to the procedure about how you clear anything like this height with uh, with FAA or anyone else that'd be concerned? Uh, certainly, Mr. Chairman. Uh, commissioners, my name is Reg Destry with Reliant Land Services. Address. Um, I need an address. Okay, sorry. 7201 East Camelback Road, Suite 310, uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, Thank you. 85251. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the every site we do goes through approval, uh, federal regulatory approval, and part of that is getting FCC clearance, which requires FAA clearance. Uh, if we're anywhere near an airport, we would do what's uh, called a Form 7460. Um, but yeah, standard FAA clearance would would involve uh, checking for any uh, helipads, airports, or any uh, flight pads nearby. Uh, that generally does come after we get through the zoning process, Okay. but I can assure you that the FCC doesn't let us turn up a site unless FAA has cleared it. What's on the poll now? Um, what's on the poll now? It is a 60-foot, it used to be a power pole that has been donated and then placed in this location. There is a screen attached to the pole to keep softballs from coming behind and hitting people that are watching the game behind home plate. It's actually so above no equipment, the backstop. So yeah. there's no equipment on the pole now? There is not currently okay. equipment on the pole. Even though the new pole is going to be just the same height? That's correct. It'll have equipment on top of it? It will. Okay. It'll actually be easier to see, won't it? Yes. I would think by a helicopter. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would doubt it would even need to be lighted. Um, it's not official, but we run something called Tau Air uh, and, and, and check before we even put a candidate in to see if we expect it would need to go through a lengthy uh, FAA review process. Okay. And this came back clearing slope with no issue. Generally, that relates more to airports than uh, helipads. But yeah, it, it, that clearance is definitely something that occurs. Ken? I just have one question. I'm, I'm fine with the height of the pole. Could you explain um, why we need this pole when we have a pole going up not too far away on Iron Springs Road. Sure. It's um, so close to me that uh, I could probably see both poles. They, they are rather close. Do you mind if I go over there? I can show you on this. Please. This might help. So 
So the need for this poll is, uh, it is rather close to that other poll, you're correct, the one at Savalini's. Um, here is uh, an existing coverage map. Uh, this map shows... Oh, I can't understand. I, look, I tried to figure that okay. out. Okay. Um, and let me put these side by side. It might actually help. This one's pretty clear. Uh, so this is the site right now served by <laughs> that site. I know we've had this discussion before. Yeah. Served by this site, uh, Gurley Street, which is over on Alarcon, and Prescott, which is, of course, on Gurley. Um, but these three sites serve the area. So everything in red is predominantly served by Prescott North. Uh, everything in yellow is by the Prescott site. Everything in blue is Gurley. Um, this site, this new site, is the one in green. Uh, the, the primary purpose for this site is actually uh, a capacity site. So every area that's served by green now that was served by a different color allows the other sites to work better. Now that site you were referring to uh, Savoyne is actually right about here. Um, so if you see, they are very close to each other, but when you start putting them in relation to how far the other sites are apart, like if you look at Prescott and Gurley Street, they are about the same distance apart as this, this proposed site and that site at Savoyne's. Uh, because we need to get the densification to get a good amount of capacity. It really is more of a capacity issue than a coverage issue. I mean, you look back at the first one, there, there are not a lot of areas that have no color here. There's a few over here, but it, it's nothing too major. It really is more an issue of getting capacity. Some of the users you have in the area, the high school is obviously a massive user of data. Uh, kids these days tend to be staring at their device all day. I mean, I've got a kindergartner that's hard to keep his face out of that thing. Well, that's one reason to vote against it. <laughs> um, additionally, the hospital. Um, because of the way the hospital's set up, it's very difficult with a lot of those heavier buildings to get good coverage in deep into the building. And, you know, folks that are sitting at the hospital, someone, the loved one's there for three, four days, a lot of times they're using their device to do whatever to pass the time or to just check up on something on WebMD, who knows. Um, because of the way those buildings are built, being on both sides, the east side and the west side, allows for good coverage and penetration into the building. So yeah, they are very close, but the, the reason for that is we need both of them. Thank you. So. Uh, my, my next question is, um, is this a single site poll, single uh, server poll? Yeah, th this poll structurally could handle additional carriers. Realistically, at a site like this, though, say AT&T, T-Mobile, Sprint, anyone else came along, a at ball fields, they generally would go with a different poll. Um, this structurally would be capable of handling additional carriers, but from a practical perspective, they would probably propose something similar on a different poll. There are so many 60-foot poles in this development between the softball field, the baseball fields at the high school, the football field at the high school, that the most likely scenario if some other carrier were to come is that they would utilize a separate pole. And how about this, the pole on Orange Springs at the Sabuini? That one is designed for multiple carriers. That one is. Yeah, I believe they ordered a three carrier pole. And that's a taller pole. And that's a bit taller than this one too, yeah. Thanks, George. George, do you have any sense of how many other poles uh, so there's other poles in the area. Do you have a sense of how many there are? At least five similar height poles nearby and probably closer to 10. There, there are a number of them that may have um, lighting fixtures on them to light fields that can also be used to um, mount um, cell sites on as well. Great. So there are a number of other locations that are possible. Uh, one, one of the other issues with this one, because of the height, it's unlikely that another carrier would want to locate below that 60-foot height when they could get to 60 feet on a different pole. Jerry, I have a question. <coughs> Speak of capacity, what, how many, how do you measure the capacity on, on these poles? Is that when you get overloaded and drop calls and so on and so forth? Is that the reason you need additional? There are a couple of capacity issues that occur. Um, the first one is with calls. Um, that is a, an issue that tended to be more of a problem with a, a couple of years ago. Now it really is an issue of data and the amount of throughput that each cell site can handle. So basically the size of the pipe that is available to customers. Um, if you've got a hundred people using the network at the same time, there's only so much bandwidth that's available to them. The amount of frequency that's available is limited. Uh, and so the amount of data is really the driving factor now on most capacity things. A additionally, uh, the newer technologies and higher frequencies uh, that are used 
don't generally get quite the uh, penetration into buildings that some of the uh, older frequencies that are generally a lower frequency that Verizon was using could get into a building. I mean, if you were using a 700 megahertz frequency, the penetration tended to be better than something at 1900 or 2100 megahertz just because, you know, the waves going like this trying to get through brick instead of going like that trying to get through brick. So, but the main capacity thing is for data for devices. Commissioners, any other questions? Anybody in the audience like to speak to this? Yes, sir. Up here, I need to get your name and address. My name is John Rinchler. I'm the director of engineering at Yapai Regional Medical Center, okay. 1003 Willow Creek Road. Um, our concern is um, I, we didn't send a, an official thing. I, you know, if it's a replacing an existing pole for height wise, um, I don't know that that's an issue. Our concern is is if we've, you know, already got one over at Savoini's and now we're doing another one here and then what's the potential for more being added but one of the big things is we wanted to find out if this had been run through the FAA just because of flight path um, we have to have three flight paths so depending on weather and all that for the helicopters um, they have to have two other alternative paths when they're coming in so that if something happens they can come back around and use another path so our concern is is that if we're going to limit those three paths, you know, as the FAA looked at this, because we've had to put, um, you know, a request into the FAA even to do parking light poles. So, and as far as lighting, I think you're incorrect on not having a light on the top of this because our building has to have a light on top of it. Um, so, yes, we are 70 feet at our building, but um, anything that's, I think it's over 30 feet, has to have a light on it. Our, our, all of our parking light poles have lights on top of them uh, for helicopters coming and going. Um, so that would be our concern. Uh, not that we're saying that, you know, we wouldn't be in agreement with the pole, but we'd like to see a light on top of it and then just um, verification with the FAA that it's approved by them as well okay flight path. so how do we get there mr verizon uh, mr chairman if you want to uh as a possible stipulation or recommendation for approval uh add that it gets cleared by the faa that's uh, completely fine uh you know we have to go through that process anyway so good so we can add it as an yes part of the uh, resolution sure okay sounds good to me and leave the light up <laughs> leave a light on for you <coughs> uh, but but I don't know I don't know if that would be our decision about a light no. right it, that would be it, more like FAA it, it will be determined by the FAA okay. as part of their review process okay anybody else in the audience no all right I think we've we're ready to move on this thing I'm gonna close public hearing uh, I'll entertain a motion I can do it. Let's see. Is this there? Okay. Uh, recommendation. Uh, move to recommend approval of SUP 14-005 for a cellular monopole antenna at 930 Roost Street with a maximum pole height of 60 feet uh, with uh, assumed FAA approval. Second. Does that work? Can we say required yes. FAA? Because they are going to be required as part of our building permit process, and they're required by um, Verizon's FCC licensing to do that. If you just change from assumed to required. Okay. okay. Yeah. Pro pro uh, yes. Thank you. And I have a second. Yeah, and again, I'm making the change to change the wording assumed to. Okay. Required. All right. So we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? No? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Say aye. 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 Okay. It's approved. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, RZ 16001502, continuation of request for a rezoning general plan amendment and amendment for a Willow Creek corridor plan for Whetstone Avenue. 
Mr. Chairman, this was an item you addressed at your last meeting. Uh, this is a request to rezone uh, the subject parcel shown here from single family to multifamily to allow for five residential units to be constructed on it. Currently has one single family home um, with a detached garage. The proposal, and I'll show you a site plan in just a moment, is to leave the single family home, add four additional units in two buildings and remove the garage as part of that process. We also identified um, an amendment to the general plan and this indicates the land uses for the general plan. The yellow, the light yellow is a single family. Uh, the orangish color uh, is multifamily. Um, the general plan land uses for this area were more or less identical to the zoning that was in place. That is not always the case, but in this neighborhood, the zoning and the general plan designations match up. Any change to the zoning would require the general plan amendment as a part of it because of the, the difference in the um, land uses indicated on that map. Just to give you a general overview of the neighborhoods to see what's there, uh, the location is identified as subject. Um, buildings adjacent to that, we have commercial buildings on the frontage with uh, Willow Creek Road. Uh, most of the other buildings are residential uses, um, although at the end of the street, just off of our aerial photo, um, there are a couple of buildings that are actually zoned commercial, and they were shown on this map. Um, and identified as potentially for future commercial uses um, within those buildings. So there's uh, quite a mix of, of uses in the neighborhood at the moment. George, what, uh, could you tell us um, that red area, what that zoning is? Uh, it's business general. The red is a business general zoning district that covers most of the area south, um, some to the north, and uh, almost all of it to the west. And all um, the white is single family? It's actually a light yellow. It's single family. Yes, sir. George, is the church, is that on the SUP or? It's, it's a conditional use permit in all zoning districts. So it's a conditional use permit allowing it in a single family zoning district. Uh, churches are permitted in all of our zoning districts. So we understand there's multifamily on either side of the subject site? That's correct. There is an intervening single family parcel to the west of the subject site and then multifamily again um, down further. One of the questions that this commission asked last meeting was how long has this zoning been in effect? And I mentioned in the staff report to you that we went back at least as far as the 1997 uh, zoning map and found all of the existing zoning exactly the same at that point. So it's been there that long and perhaps it goes back further than that. Um, Finding our previous zoning maps a little difficult um, beyond about the last 20 years. And George, isn't there one house across from the subject property that's um, not zoned but is a duplex? That's correct. One of the uses is a duplex. It was um, a very old building. It predated the um, zoning, uh, single-family zoning that was in effect there. So it's continued as a legal non-conforming use all these years. So that's somewhat like multifamily. It is, it would be considered multifamily for our purposes. In order to construct new, you would have to have the same multifamily medium or multifamily high zoning in order to construct a duplex. So that could be effectively colored yellow. Uh, for uses, it should be um, the same color as the multifamily high or multifamily medium zoning, but its actual zoning is single family and it is grandfathered. So the multifamily zoning on that street's been there for years, years and years. Years and you, years. Yes. You sir. don't. You don't have a record. Um, the same I mean, for the twenty years. The same for the commercial south of it. Um, that that's also been there. This those, is those this three is the parcels. Willow Creek corridor plan, and I apologize. It's very difficult to see. Under our old zoning district, RC was multifamily zoning, and you can see RC zoning was in place. Um, at the time that this original plan was put together, and that was 97. It was updated in 2003, and that remained the same. In 2005, we changed our zoning designations to what we have now, which shows the multifamily high. So the only change there is the, the one commercial zoning, rezoning at this corner. on Willow Creek. Yes, at this corner. So that one's the only one that's changed in the area. These have been 
a commercial zoning for some time. Okay. And George, um, isn't there isn't that lot on the north side of Westing uh, at Gale Gardner? Isn't there a commercial use in that? Is it I believe there's a home occupation use in there, but I believe it's occupied as a residential use, primary residential use. The area is in transition, and it should all be appropriate. But the, the streets okay. to the north and the street to the south are significantly more commercial in both cases than, <coughs> than this than Wetstein. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I, I have trouble with this whole street here. I, I think somebody ought to get together and I feel bad if we just zone this one parcel, which I feel should be zoned. But I think that we got to clean up some messes from other years here on this street. This is, uh, you've got six lots, not including the subject, that are surrounded by commercial or multifamily that aren't. It's the result of spot zoning over the years. And I think we or somebody, maybe the city needs to help uh, get something together where we change this whole street because I, I don't see that this is this is going to keep coming back. Hey, <laughs> well, yeah. it, it, it's been a long-standing policy. We've got the right to go in and, and make no. changes. The property no. owner has to come in and request them. So if that those may, six property yes. owners. That may be the case. I'm just I'm suggesting. And, and say to conform to the neighborhood. We'd all like to see our zoning change to multifamily high and make it consistent with the rest of the area. Then we react to it, but I don't think we ought to push. I didn't say we should. I said okay. I'd like to see. Okay, all right. I'd like to I, see something I'll happen see. here on this street. So staff has had contact with at least one other property on the street, wanting to know what the process would be, and we offered to help facilitate if they want to get together um, and try to do something like that. Um, but I haven't heard anything back at this point in time. George. Well, it's that the duplex. It's um, should be multi-family, medium, or high. Um, if if that building to burn down or anything wouldn't the, that trigger the fact that it would have to be rezoned to be replaced or would that be grandfathered in forever? It, it's grandfathered in forever unless they change the use voluntarily. So if they were to demolish the building voluntarily, they could only build back single family home. Um, our code calls for an act of God or casualty is the terms we use in the zoning code. If, if something happens that's outside the owner's control that causes the loss of the building, they can replace it because it is legal nonconforming. And, and then on, on the group home item, we discussed that last time, and that is the fact that there are already within the, the area, uh, the distance limitations group homes so that this new multifamily apartment complex could not be turned into a group home. At this point in time, it could not be That's because true. of distance separation. I have to point out that that is a, a dynamic relationship. Place yeah, is closed. If one leaves, another one can come in. It's a possibility Maybe. for it to happen. One, no one of the things to consider, though, in 95% in of the known group homes that we have in town are in single family homes, not in multifamily mm -hmm. settings. There are only a few in multifamily settings. Okay, uh, anybody in the audience like to speak to this? I know we took a lot of, uh, a lot of people spoke at the last meeting and uh, we kind of heard everybody's concerns. So is there anybody here with other concerns you'd like to present? No? Okay. They're debating. Okay. We do, we do have the applicant and his representative here as well. So if you have more questions about anything specific to their development plans, they're available to answer those questions. Well, okay. Why don't we? Why don't we just hear your, what you're kind of basically planning and uh, explain, you know, maybe the physical features of, of your plan? I understand these are just going to be, uh, these are going to be two new two-story buildings. So they essentially will look like single family houses anyway, right? Good morning, commissioners. Mark Pugh, 555 Lincoln Avenue. I, actually, they're single story structures. Oh, single uh, story, okay. Correct, they, uh, they will be very, very um, unobtrusive in terms of uh, appearance. Uh, we're, uh, we're looking at the uh, immediate area that we've got that is basically a business area. We've got employment opportunities virtually within walking distance all the way around our plan is to market to the working professional, perhaps single, uh, whether it be from the high school, whether it be from 12th Street uh, Medical Center, wherever it be from, <clears throat> uh, on strictly a rental basis. 
Okay, so as far as the as, as neighbors are concerned about some big high density building, a thing going in that's not going to happen. These are going to be two one story, fairly small buildings, right? So they, as far as I I can see, they're going to appear just like single family houses on those lots. Very much so. Okay, there was a. Uh, uh, you, anything else you need to add? You know, I, I don't know that uh, that it's necessary. I did uh, uh, walk around the neighborhood and and, uh, and take a look at what was there. I've got some photographs. If anybody's interested, perhaps everybody has gone out and visited the site. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, <clears throat> from what I can tell, uh, we're really going to bring this piece of property more in keeping with with what's there. You know, all the way around. We've got you know uh, some businesses that uh, that were mentioned uh, in previous discussion along that street. We've got some that uh, appear to be businesses that uh, that weren't mentioned uh, in the immediate area uh, so you know there's some other uh, some other things that uh, that I could bring to light up if, uh, if necessary but at this particular point no. yeah yeah we've got a very humble very simple you know project that we'd okay. like to proceed with thank you I appreciate that George there was a lot of discussion about traffic at the intersection of uh, Westin and uh, Willow Creek and you guys were going to have the traffic engineer, but I don't see him here. Uh, we attempted to get him here, um, and he still may show up. Um, fortunately, some other things have come up that have tied him up. Um, I'm not going to tell you he's stuck in traffic anywhere. Uh, <laughs> one, one, of the, one of the things okay. that he did for us, though, was to actually look at nearby traffic issues, because okay. there, there was a letter submitted to us that had a, um, accident reports right. from the police department. The breakdown. And giving the volume of traffic in the area and the number of street intersections that were included in the streets on those reports, it didn't really jump out as an issue for the traffic engineer. Um, there wasn't anything particularly especially dangerous with those two ends did other you, than the the issues you would have with any intersection non signalized did intersection. staff specifically discuss this situation with the traffic engineer just via an email via email yes okay and his response uh, again he didn't seem to think there was any particular um, unusual situation here okay uh, there's a great deal of volume of traffic on the adjacent streets east and west that volume of traffic by itself would generate the number of, of accidents um, uh, even okay. considered a safe street I'm gonna close the public hearing and well yeah okay. and then I want to hear from everybody can tell me what they feel about it all right, Terry. Well, George, could you explain the access and egress on Black Drive and on Whitsun, uh on both uh, Gale Gardner and on uh, Willow Creek? I'm trying to find a map and that's far it, enough out. In driving it, there's like, oh. is one street one way or is it just the egress from so a number of years ago, there was the Gale Gardner, I'm sorry, the Ponderosa redevelopment plan that was initially um, started out with the, the intent to redo the shopping center where Walmart now is. Um, that was the city's mall at one time, and there was a redevelopment program that went into effect. As part of that, a great deal of consideration of the traffic on um, what was called Black Drive at the time, Gale Gardner, um, that was an issue back then because it was a private street. Um, one of the things that was done was that this, this corner was modified so that no traffic can't make a turn in eastbound right. onto Wetstein. And that was to reduce the amount of cut through traffic because the traffic issues were so bad along here, a lot of traffic was simply cutting through Wetstein to get to Willow Creek Road. To the south, uh, 12th place is significantly higher elevation wise. You can't make a connection between 12th place and Gail Gardner, um, at least not one that you can get a car up. So the cut through traffic was taking the first opportunity to get through to, to Willow Creek Road and that was Wetstein. So that was a modification made to protect the residents um, all, along Wetstein, even before the current zoning went into effect and before the uh, Gail, or Ponderosa Plaza redevelopment plan was adopted. Uh, that's remained in place. Uh, we would anticipate that would stay in place. So no right <laughs> turns, no turns eastbound from uh, Gail Gardner onto Wetstein. The, the street further north, Black Drive, 
um, does have full access both directions from Willow Creek um, Road to Gail Gardner. That street is primarily commercial. Um, in fact, I don't believe any of the, the buildings other than the multifamily residence on the corner um, actually have any um, residential uses in them any longer. They're all primary businesses. They may have secondary residential as part of these small homes up here that were converted to businesses. So this one is unique in that it was a primary residential use along the street and the city did take action to make sure that um, that eastbound traffic cut through was reduced. Now they didn't do the same thing from the other direction. So westbound traffic can still cut through Wettstein to get to the shopping center to the west. Okay, thank you. I did have another question about parking, but after the applicant indicated that they're just gonna be one story, uh, it's not gonna be an attraction for multiple cars that don't appear like. Right. Uh, it, and at present, we, we've done a review uh, for parking purposes of the plan as submitted, um, at least a preliminary review. We do it again when they submit for building permitting. Um, and they, they appear to meet our requirements. So it doesn't create a lot of extra parking, but it creates sufficient parking. And that's all our code calls for. Okay, thank you. So Terry, what's your thinking on this? My thinking is, I say we approve it. What's your approve? Okay. You know, Len, you have a comment? No, I just think that it makes sense to get some consistency in a transitional neighborhood. Okay. Anybody else? Comments? I'm Ken? all for it. I just like to see the neighbors get together and change the whole street. We've had that situation before where the city actually initiated action, but... Uh, but I'm not sure you can do it here. We can legally do it. Generally, policy is it's property owner generated right. for any kind of rezoning. Right. We don't like to impose zoning. Well, obviously, on this, this this street, this neighborhood, but especially this street's been in transition for 30 years. <laughs> so uh, it's a slow transition. Yeah, you know, and I and so there's already been precedent set. You've already approved. Maybe 30 years ago, those multifamily sites were were changed from single family, and so you know it's almost like how, how can you deny someone else in the when it's been there for it's been happening for all those years. Uh, David, Chairman, yeah, I I agree with the consensus here, the emerging consensus that proposed use is consistent with other adjacent uh, properties, and I I'm inclined to support. It. George, I think this is right within the character of what's already out there. Okay. I'll entertain a motion. All right, no, I'll make a motion, Tom. Okay. Uh, George, one motion for the uh, <clears throat> RZ and one for the GP or combined? You can combine them together. Your recommendation will go to the city Thank council. You. And I did want to point out that this is a recommendation. It goes to the city council. We will re-notice the neighbors so that they can attend the council meeting for, for council's action on and it. And they can appeal. Or, yeah. it, yes. But the, like they said, you're saying this is just a recommendation. That's so correct. Uh, if the city council acts, they could appeal that action if they wanted to, right? Um, one, of, one of the things that could be done is they could appeal the action sort of before council votes on it and make it um, a more difficult vote. I see. The, the um, what they call a supermajority vote in state statutes, which is six of seven council members yeah. to approve. Okay. So the motion is going to be moved to approve uh, the approval of RZ 15-002 which is the request for zoning, and approve the GP15002, which is the request to modify the general plan. Okay. Second. Is that motion fine? Very okay, clear. I have Thank a motion you. and a second. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor, raise your hand. Aye, okay. It carries. Uh, and we've already discussed any appeals that the citizens might wanna have. As okay. part of our notification to uh, the neighbors before going to council, we will reiterate that to them. Okay, George, any uh, city updates? No, sir. Not Good. at the moment. Um, Current recent events? I will point out that the city's uh, general plan will be on the August 25th um, ballot. Um, we would hope to see citizens take action on that. Well, it ought to get a, little, a lot of action with the three tax initiatives oh, okay. on there, too. I would guess there's going to be a few people turn out for the vote. I see 25,000 people voting this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're adjourned.
I'd like to see 25, but I doubt it. <laughs>